My name is Peter Lawrence, and I'm the Chief of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at UCLA, as well as the Director of the Gonda Vascular Center. You are listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining an interview with the surgeon. Today, we have Dr. Peter Lawrence. Doc, how are we doing today? I'm doing well. How about you? Doing good. Thanks for being with us. So let's just jump right into it. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did those change throughout your fellowship? Well, I would say that they uh, evolved, as the question implies, even from college, uh, because one of the great challenges for people that go into surgery is getting into medical school, uh, which is not that easy to do. Where I work now at UCLA, 2% of the applicants are accepted or attend UCLA. So the first process is to actually be able to start your career. And there are many talented people who don't get that opportunity because their grades aren't quite good enough or they haven't done well enough on the MCAT exams or something like that. Um, so part of being in medical school and residency, uh, and each time as you move up a level, you're getting to a new competitive group uh, to the point where in our fellowship, we interview 50 some people for one position. So it's a very competitive world to move through it. And I think for many of us, it just even getting in to get started is the key to get the opportunity to even practice uh, in the career. Once you get into the medical school, the residency, and then for me, a fellowship, once you get those, uh, then I think your goal is to be as completely trained as possible so that you have a lot of flexibility uh, once you begin to practice. And your attitude changes somewhat about uh, training and education, which is the center of a medical school residency and fellowship to moving to the process of taking care of patients and making sure that you're as good a doctor as you can possibly be for those patients. Now, during your fellowship, what would you say was your mentality as you head into the job search process for the first time and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? Well, I started knowing after medical school that I wanted an academic career, that I wanted to work in an academic medical center. And although it's a little bit different today than it was at that time, in general, people decide they're either gonna go into practice or that they're gonna go into academics. And many of the people go into academics, do it to a large degree because they don't wanna deal with the business and other sides of medicine that they haven't been trained in, their attitude is just to take care of patients and be the best doctor that they can. But I think that as over the years, the, the, there's been a merger between uh, academic, particularly surgeons, and people in practice. And there are a lot of people, including many in our group and our division, uh, who are could be practicing in private practice today. People in practice, in an academic center can be as private practice oriented. It can be in a, in a university environment and totally private practice oriented. And we have some people who they, they do teach, but their goal is to uh, take care of patients and to take care particularly of complex medical problems. And, uh, they could just as easily be in a private office or in a private setting. And there are some people who work in a more private setting who are teaching residents, students all the time because students rotate there. For example, UCLA is a academically oriented medical center. Cedar sinai is a very distinguished institution with lots of great researchers. But there are people at Cedars that probably teach as much or more than people at UCLA. And there's some people at UCLA that are more practice oriented than the people at Cedars. So it's not like there's a uniform uh, situation where everybody goes in one direction or the other, which is some closer to what it was when I started. Can you kind of take us through your journey on how you ended up at UCLA? Sure. 
Uh, the first job that I had after my residency, I trained at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City, which is a, a really outstanding training program. And actually before that, I went to medical school, and finished at Harvard Medical School. Um, when I finished my fellowship in vascular surgery, uh, which was at that time, rather than a seven-year training as it is now for many people, a six-year training. But when I finished that, um, I had to decide on the private practice versus academic, which I had pretty well decided on by then, but what part of the country. My wife is also in academics, and uh, she, uh, when we were looking for jobs for both of us in the academic world, I had a mentor uh, who had been at the University of Utah, and he said he think he thought that I would fit in very well, and that I would uh, I would like Salt Lake City, Utah, and the University of Utah. So my first job was based on the advice of my mentors, and also an institution that needed a vascular surgeon, but it also needed someone in my wife's field, which was in modern British literature. Uh, so they had to have both jobs. When I went to the University of Utah, uh, the, uh, there wasn't a lot of negotiating about what I was going to do. Uh, uh, I was told by the chief of surgery that they needed help at the Veterans Hospital and also at the university. And I worked at both institutions and now, then also an affiliated hospital in Salt Lake City, Utah. I did that for 20 years and gradually built up the practice to the point where we hired could hire five people. I was really the only vascular surgeon who was dedicated just to vascular disease when I arrived. And there were five people as we were able to build the volume to we had five people. Uh, but I realized that it, at some point, if I wanted to go further in administration or in a leadership position, either nationally or even at the institution, that I needed to move to another institution. So uh, I moved uh, to, to California. Again, with my wife, we coordinated things. So um, we both moved uh, to jobs at University of California, Irvine. And that was, I was in the Dean's office at UCI uh, and in charge of uh, first program development and then the Dean of Clinical Affairs. At the si same time, my wife had moved up in Utah, and she was the Dean of Humanities at UC Irvine. Uh, I did that for five years and then was called by friends uh, and colleagues in vascular disease management, vascular surgery at UCLA. This is now 17 years ago. Uh, and they asked me if I was interested in a job at UCLA running the vascular division. Now you might think going from a Dean's office position to a chief of vascular surgery would be either a parallel or step down. But to me, because of the great reputation of UCLA and the magnitude of the institution, uh, and I don't know in absolute terms, but it's many times bigger than UCI, I decided that I would concentrate on just vascular disease and vascular surgery. And that's how I ended up at, at UCLA, uh, is after a five year stint uh, at UC Irvine. And during that time at UC Irvine, I uh, learned a tremendous amount about the business side of at least academic medicine. I sat in the dean's office with the CEO of the hospital, who's a fellow named Mark Larratt, who's now the CEO at, at UCSF, and a, uh, the head of finance, Ron King, who uh, was an accountant and an MBA, who really ran the business side of it. So going to every meeting and sitting next to them, I learned a lot about the business side of academic medicine, uh, which was very helpful to me in my career at UCLA. Now, what would you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climbed to the top of the industry? Well, the value in surgery and in medicine is, uh, but particularly in surgery, is uh, patient care. It's getting good results, dealing with the most complicated problems, and then publishing those results in medical journals. And uh, it, it's the idea of, we talk about the four-legged stool of academic surgery, which is 
clinical practice, research, teaching, and administration. Now, not everybody does all four of those, but if you can do all four, you have the opportunity, uh, that's what propels your career. And uh, to whatever extent I did it, hopefully by outside people assessing me, they've decided that I did it pretty well. That's where you get advanced. If you're highly published, if you uh, review for journals, and if you have grants, then that gives you the academic credibility. If you have a large practice and take care of incredibly complex problems and get good results, that takes care of the clinical side of things. And then the commitment to teaching students, residents, fellows, and building a program, an education program, takes care of the education. For, for many people, they can do those three things. It's unusual for people to be able to do all four well, but that fourth one of administration, and that includes understanding not only the business side of medicine, but how you manage and develop uh, large programs is the administrative side. That's the four parts of the four-legged stool. Now, seeing that you oversee the program there, what type of advice do you have for the chief residents and the fellows as they head into the job search process for the first time? Well, I think that uh, it really varies a lot by the climate. And I would say my advice might be very different today with COVID and the challenges uh, in a, an environment where the typical practice sur of surgery is not possible uh, versus times when uh, there is a, uh, a great need. We're fortunate in our specialty, and I, I don't know exactly the percentage today, but historically there have been five to seven jobs for every person that finishes their training. So there are jobs that go unfilled. The other side of things is that our field of vascular disease management has expanded to not just be vascular surgery, but include endovascular, treating vessels from the inside, and also vascular medicine, getting the best results by modifying risk factors, stopping smoking, controlling blood pressure, diabetes, things like that. So the field is expanded in scope, and it's very important for uh, residents and fellows when they finish their training to recognize that they still have a lot to learn. And one of the things that I talk to them about is the importance of going to a practice, whether it's academic or private practice, where their colleagues are true colleagues and ask, act as mentors. If they, they're not done with their training in the sense that there are some operations that you might see uh, five times in a lifetime in a career, and you need to have mentors who have dealt with those kinds of problems, you need to have those mentors to work with you and to be a colleague who supports you, maybe helps you in managing those patients without taking those patients away from you. If you're always passing them on to the most senior person, you won't develop. And yet, on the other hand, if you don't have anybody to discuss the cases with, the patients won't get the best care. So it's really having a good mentor is as important as having a great income in your, the first job. Now, can you tell us a little bit about your involvement in the Society of Vascular Surgery? Sure. Uh, well, I've been in it for a, a number of years. There are three or four important societies for everybody and every vascular surgeon, and they tend to be local, regional, and national. And within the national society, the most prestigious is the Society for Vascular Surgery. But there are other very good, there's a Society for Clinical Vascular Surgery, which has a very large number of people. And then there's one devoted to venous disease called the American Venus Forum, which was a spinoff of the Society for Vascular Surgery, but now has become very independent. Uh, the way you, I think, progress within a society like the SVS is number one, that you participate. And that means that you submit papers to the national meetings, you discuss papers that other people have written, and you participate on committees. Uh, and all of those uh, activities, if you do them well, uh, will, you know, over time, you'll advance. So I had no major sort of goal of 
becoming the president of the SDS, although that happened. But my goal, I realized was important, was to just do the best job I could when I presented a paper was on a committee. Uh, there's a famous saying from a, one of the giants of surgery, who's, you know, was from 50 years ago, but he had two rules in administration and it applies to societies. He was at the University of Minnesota, I believe his name was Owen Wang, and he had two rules. One was when you are requested to participate on a committee at the University of Minnesota or on any activity like that, always accept the invitation. Or never turn it down. And then his second rule was never go. And interestingly, that was the attitude of surgeons, was live in the operating room, you just do cases and never go to committee meetings, sort of do things through a back door. You know, you go and you call up the CEO of the hospital and tell them what you want, or you don't go to the meeting. It's just the opposite of that. And having been now the president of the Society for Vascular Surgeon, it's just the opposite. It's never accept a committee assignment unless you're gonna actively participate and always go. And if you accept assignments, or don't do a good job with presenting papers, you get a reputation for somebody who's somewhat superficial. If you, every time you get a committee assignment or responsibility, if you accept that and participate in the calls, but also have creative ideas, you'll move up in that committee and become a chair of the committee. And then that committee leads to another one. And mine was just an evolution through a couple of what I thought at the time were innovative ideas. Uh, one was that uh, all young residents and fellows uh, present uh, their papers at a session that was a poster session. Posters had always been sort of the last choice. You know, you, if you didn't get your paper on at the main meeting, you would print a poster, tack it up on a board, and... People would read it, walk by and say, yeah, you know, you had an interesting poster. It's a lot of work and not much reward. And one of the things that I did when I got to be the chair of the education committee is I decided we were going to turn the poster session into a really enjoyable, fun, but interesting, challenging experience. So what we said was, we're going to break the posters up into topics like aortic aneurysm, carotid stenosis, and we're going to have about 10 posters, 120 in the whole meeting. And it's gonna be like a game show. And what we're gonna do is give everybody with a timer, beat the clock timer, we're gonna give everybody three minutes to tell what's on the poster, two minutes to answer questions, and then everybody who's listening is gonna grade you from one to 10. And the winner of the, of the, the 120 to 10 sessions is then gonna go up on stage a day later and gonna present it to the entire membership of the SVS, which is, can be up to 1, 1,200 people. And you do the same thing. And at the end of that, the audience, through an audience response system, is gonna vote on who the press presentations. And we're gonna give out an award of $1,500 for the best presentation, 1,000 for the second best, and 500 for the third. But we're gonna make it fun, and that, really transformed the whole poster session. I had people after that who wouldn't submit their paper to the regular plenary main session because they wanted to be on the poster session. They thought, so that's an example of something where you get a chair of a committee and it led to what I thought was a pretty innovative way to make, to train residents and fellows as to how to present papers at a national meeting in a non-stressful but very enjoyable and real learning experience and i think maybe that's what led to me being selected then to be the the program chair for the whole meeting the sds meeting which is not just more than the more than the poster session and then ended up with me being invited to be the president of the sds now on that topic with the annual conferences almost all but being virtual right now through zoom or go to meetings you know, what type of advice do you have for these residents and fellows that would normally be able to rub shoulders with someone like yourself at annual conference, but now their whole outreach process has changed? Well, I think that still the principles uh, are similar in that you still present papers at the meeting. People listen on Zoom 
and um, you can get to be recognized if you do a really good job, uh, even though it's not quite the same as going out to dinner or to a social event. I think it's going to be a challenge and harder and realize we've only been doing this for four months. So it's hard to know how long this is going to last. Um, I've also, I've participated in a number of those sessions, uh, listening to them. And what's impressed me is that it gives the person who's presenting the opportunity to almost present it better than they could when they were at the meeting and walked up on this, on the podium and there were, 600 to 1,000, 1,200 people in the audience. Um, they do it from home, uh, but they can present it like we're doing now, and you can have a script, and if you really properly prepare for it, you can give a great talk, uh, which will be, I think, recognized. So it's not the same, and I, I can't say that um, the society is gonna evolve in the same way because of COVID and hopefully we'll get a vaccine and we'll get back to in-person meetings. But I also think that uh, there was a trend toward doing more online meetings even before COVID. It just it accelerated that process. So many of us who uh, grew up traveling to meetings, it got to be almost nonstop uh, last year before the COVID started uh, at, through my job at the SVS and then the editorship of the journal, last year um, I did 180,000 miles of airline travel. So I went to China twice, I went to Japan, went to uh, South Korea, went to um, South America twice, and then all over the United States and once to Canada. Oh, and I forgot Europe. So when, by the time you add all that up, it's like you're on the road constantly. And when you think about it, it takes you a day to get there, a day to get home. And you may only be on stage uh, if you're asked to give an important plenary talk. It might be 30 to 50 minutes. And you may give a paper or two. By the time, the total amount of time, other than rubbing elbows with and seeing your old friends, maybe a total of an hour is that, and it costs $5,000 to do it. Somebody pays for it. But when you think about it, is that really an efficient use of a surgeon's time? So if we can improve the, the online things like the podcast that we're doing, or we can make it so the experience is close to what it was when you traveled, it's a lot less expensive and it's a lot more efficient as far as time use to try to learn how to, do more of our meetings virtual. Doesn't mean we'll never have a meeting, but I found that I was at least once a month and often two or three times a month. I get home, I do some cases at UCLA, and the next week I was on a plane flying to another country. It was just nonstop travel. And I think that probably uh, it's better to be somewhere between where we are now and where we were then. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.